episode of the Irish Economics Podcast. This week we have a departure from the usual COVID-related topics. If you're a bit like myself and you find yourself with COVID fatigue from time to time, hopefully we have an interesting conversation for you to settle into. In this episode, I'm joined by Jonathan Ruan, a lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management and adjunct at TCD. Jonathan and I discussed the impact artificial intelligence may have on the global economy. We go through this disruptive technology And we introduced them, uh, for those unfamiliar, and we discuss how these technologies may develop. This is something I find fascinating myself, um, as projections of how these technologies might develop vary from something akin to science fiction right up to something similar to what we're familiar with, such as, say, the Model T or the development of the Internet. So it's very interesting to, to delve into this topic. I suppose it's important to note that this episode was recorded many months ago in a pre-COVID world. I met Jonathan in Dublin over the Christmas break before social distancing was a part of our vocabulary. It's funny how the world's developed and as I was editing this episode over the weekend, it was interesting to hear us talk about the economy in a context of how the world was back then. At one stage we talk about haircuts, little did we know that that would become a sought after luxury. We also have an eerie premonition about how AI could be developed to aid the tracking of disease, something which takes on a whole new light nowadays. Nevertheless, however, this is an interesting and informative discussion and an issue which will be on the gen agenda for many years to come. So that said, uh, I'll leave you to it and hope you all enjoy this conversation with Jonathan. Okay, hello and welcome to this episode of the Irish Economics Podcast. Uh, on today's episode, I'm joined by Jonathan Ruan. Jonathan is a lecturer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the Global Economics and Management Group and a member of MIT's Initiative on the Digital Economy. So Jonathan uh, has a varied background. He's an entrepreneur as well as an academic and among his interests is involved in understanding the economic implications of machine learning and artificial intelligence and has co-founded MIT's Commercialization of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics graduate course. So, Jonathan, you're very welcome to uh, this episode of, of the Irish Economics Podcast. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So, first of all, uh, it'd be very interesting to just hear a bit about yourself uh, in terms of your background. Many people might not be, be familiar with you. How did you get into this area of artificial intelligence and in terms of research and teaching on it? And maybe we could start from the start. Where did you study? What was your area of study? And how did you progress from there? Okay. Um, my main studies were at UCD. Um, and actually, when I finished up there, my first career path was to join a large multinational. So I worked for Procter & Gamble um, for a couple of years. And they were based out of London. I worked in brand management for them. I left that. I always had an interest in technology. I left that and co-founded a small startup company in Dublin with my brother. Um, we raised some venture capital funding. We expanded that business and eventually sold it. During that time, I'd always stayed in touch with the academia. I was doing some teaching at UCD. And so after we sold the company, um, I got the opportunity to go over to MIT. I'd originally planned to only go for a year. And uh, four or five years later, I'm still there. So I suppose my areas of interest interest, the things that uh, I suppose work for me in terms of that career path, which is maybe not an obvious one, but it's really stuff at the intersection of uh, the uh, digital economy. So how technology in all its various formats uh, affects business models and the economy. Um, and I suppose I am mainly based out of the Sloan School of Management, so economics adjacent rather than pure economics. Sure. So was your company in the area of digital technology and business? Is that how you got into this area? Yeah, um, uh, I suppose I've always been uh, not too concerned about the e exact technology uh, that we were using. We, we really looked, it was about 10 years ago, and we really looked at the time at what, you know, 
uh, emerging technologies were coming out that we thought had a big chance to actually change some industries. And at the time, cloud uh, computing, which is obviously ubiquitous now at this stage, was still very emergent. And we really tried to uh, look at that, looked at it as a rising tide that was going to float a lot of boats and then try to figure out where exactly we could find a niche within that, find a sector that could utilize it. And so, you know, I've uh, experienced maybe from that point of view, you know, uh, bringing uh, traditional software, enterprise um, software up to the cloud. And I, um, and, and, and so when I ended up, uh, as I do now, more focused on machine learning, I kind of look at that as the major the next or one or two of the uh, biggest waves that we've seen in the last 10 or 20 years. So I'm interested in looking at what are these waves and at the very earliest stages, uh, how do they start to dissipate across the economy? And, and Okay. And then, so your work then in at MIT and the Sloan School of Management, it seems a lot of your interest is in new technologies at an early stage. How would that tie into research and teaching that goes on at an MIT how do you how does new technologies how does that link in with the sort of business aspect of things there yeah um I suppose I think personally speaking MIT is probably one of the best institutions around for this because it's a very technology focused uh university institution it's a research institute primarily um so across campus we have a lot of research going on in a lot of the areas that we eventually might want to um, discuss at something like a business school um, in the very earliest stages. So um, the course I teach, for example, you know, you've got uh, predominantly MBA students, but then you'll also have a number of the computer science PhD students who will come across and it's a great mix and pot. So we're able to talk to actual people who are at the frontier of some say machine learning in this example um, uh, research, but also then combine it and try to understand how how is this affecting uh, labor markets? How is this affecting business models? And how is this going to affect maybe international trade? And that's kind of what we're looking at at the very early stages. And the research group I'm involved with, the Initiative on the Digital Economy, um, very much along the similar patterns as well. It was uh, two of the main guys I work with there, Eric Benjolson and Andy McAfee, um, are you know some of the m- most... Um, distinguished uh, researchers I guess in the whole field of digital economics so um, they've been looking at this over several decades Um, and of course you know machine learning is interesting now I believe it's and we'll talk about this I'm sure a bit more I believe it'll be very interesting to academics and the economy and society for decades to come Um, but it's not the first technology that's emerged that have this kind of big impact and you can actually learn an awful lot by looking at previous iterations and that's kind of maybe a lot of where our research is grounded try to understand technically what's interesting in you today but also how can we model it um at a very detailed level and learn from from previous iterations okay now that's a very nice introduction in terms of how this sort of new technology might affect in terms of the economics behind it all as well um okay so maybe it might be interesting then to discuss well what exactly is artificial intelligence and machine learning We, we hear these buzzwords a lot lately and the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people would be a Sp- Spielberg movie or something like that. Right. But um, So how does it differ from standard computing? Right. Well, the first thing is probably worth mentioning is machine learning is really just a branch of artificial intelligence. So AI is a quite a broad church in terms of a concept. It probably means different things to different people. And it's probably also constantly evolving in terms of uh, what we might consider AI to, uh, today to be. Somebody might just call that technology in the future. Mm-hmm. And the same could be said across the last couple of decades. It's a phrase that's only been around about you know, 60 or 70 years. And across that period of time, there has been many um, iterations or periods where they thought actually they've cracked this or that we're onto something really hot here and it turned out to not be uh, so brilliant and so breakthrough. And so what we've seen more recently in the last maybe five or a little bit more years around machine learning has actually started to deliver some very tangible results, maybe more so than some of the previous iterations. And that does not mean, however, that we're on a path to um, what they call strong AI. And maybe we'll go into that in a, in a little bit uh, more detail. But to answer your question, like what's different between machine learning and say normal software, let's call it. The simplest way to look at it is to consider normal software as rules based. Everything that happens basically occurs because of an if this, then that statement. So mm-hmm. if I press this button on the Facebook homepage, then it will bring me to the next 
page that that you know that I wanted to go to. So if this then that, so it's all rules based. So the only thing you can get a computer to do is what you can tell it based on rules. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing about how humans interact with the natural world is there's an awful lot that we can do that we cannot explain. Right. Um, Polony, Carl Polony talked about this. Uh, it's him that kind of came up with the phrases. Uh, we know more than we can tell. And so if we as human beings can't even explain how we know certain things, we have very little ability. Well, there's no chance we're going to be able to write down the rules that we'll be able to describe it so that we can instruct a computer to do it. Okay. And so what um, a number of researchers have done in the recent past to uh, try to crack this in, in one small way is the advances in machine learning. And that's, why, that's where we basically try to teach a computer without giving it all the instruction sets, without giving it all the rules, mm-hmm. how to uh, uh, do very specific tasks in very specific areas that look like they have human level of intelligence, but really they only ha- they're only mimicking it really. Yeah. And so that's where it may differ from something like a Steven Spielberg movie. Sure. Okay. So when it comes to things like um, image recognition, I suppose is, is probably a poster boy when it comes to uh, machine learning. That it, it sort of it looks at different images, it sort of picks up the patterns, and then it can predict. It's almost like a statistical model that it can predict what, what, what's most likely to be the outcome. If it's a good algorithm, it'll predict it 99% of the time. Yeah, I think that's a good example of it. I mean, the image recognition works so well because um, uh, for the, there's numerous different types of machine learning. The type of one that's really had the biggest impact have been in supervised, where if we take the example of image recognition, if, you, if a human being labels on an image where exactly the cat is, and it does, the human does that a thousand times. Now we've got a thousand images, and on every image we've labeled the cat. If we feed that into a machine learning algorithm, and it's well trained and it does what it's meant to do, and there are lots of them that that, that can do this today, um, when you show it the ten thousand and first image, it will be able to tell you with a very high degree of probability whether there is a cat in that picture or not. So really, it's a prediction engine in some in in, in some terms. Um, and there are other forms uh, other than just that supervised learning where we've labeled the, the images. Um, they work in certain circumstances, but the, the uh, um, yeah, supervised is probably where the, the biggest impact is at the moment. Right, okay. And my understanding of machine learning is that where you have a normal statistical model, you have the input, you have the output, and you understand the steps in between. Whereas machine learning, there are a few steps in between that the supervisor doesn't fully understand how it got the the answer. Would that be correct? That's correct. I mean, the supervisor knows what he or she told the learning algorithm to do, but he doesn't necessarily know there within that what weightings it might put on something. Um, so that does not mean that we don't know what it's doing. It's not some, they talk about it being a black box. It, it, I mean, it is to a some degree, uh, it's not completely known because obviously we didn't write all the rules, tell it all the weightings, um, etc. But it's, it, you know, it's not a complete mystery to us either. Mm-hmm. And that part of it is both the magic of it it's why it works so well but that's also one of the things people maybe um have the most difficulty with it and especially around trust in this new technology yeah so and that brings us down to before we move on to the economics you mentioned there's there's like a general intelligence that people talk about which is sort of like this spielberg movie and then we have i don't know what the fr- correct phrase is but this sort of directed single use type of intelligence and um if we have this uncertainty when it comes to general intelligence, well, then that's where it might get a bit scary or whatever. Well, I, I think that's exactly it. What we call the, the word I think you were looking for there is the uh, weak AI. So weak AI, okay. a weak AI actually is something like image recognition um, that may be able to perform at a higher level than human beings are. It's not weak in that specific task. It's weak in so far as it's not conscious or sure. sentient like a human being. So human intelligence is a very, very different type of thing. And so far as the example I gave there about image recognition and the computer being able to statistically say whether the next image contains a cat or not, it does not know what a cat is. It has never actually uh, lived or breathed or, you know, understood the world like a human being. So that type of intelligence um, is, uh, I mean, uh, to put it mildly, a long way away. Uh, There's people who believe that it'll come eventually, but there's no serious uh, path between where we are today and and, and, and getting anywhere near there tomorrow. And I think that's maybe where people get confused. 
at the end, like every human being understands intelligence from their own existence. So we all think about the word intelligence and then we kind of anthropomorphize it to some degree. We project it onto other uh, other animals. We might project it onto dogs and interpret yeah. their reactions to something in it, and we interpret them through like a human intelligence yeah. lens because it's very hard for us to abstract intelligence. Computers have a very different type of intelligence sure, than yeah. humans. Now, I don't know if this is something that you've thought about, but I see these guys, these futurists, like Ray Kurzweil and these guys, and they sort of say, well, they see technological progress as like an exponential curve, right? and we're on the cusp of the vertical part, yes. and that he's, he thinks that in the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to get this artificial intelligence. Sure. It's not something I buy into. Yeah, uh, sure. Ray is a very accomplished guy and very smart guy, much smarter than me, but I think uh, just using those exponential lines and assuming the singularity because of his uh, existing trajectory, I think is is dangerous. There, There's lots of reasons to, to doubt something like that. I mean, even for me, like one of the simplest things is to think about it from the point of view of um, calculations. So if you look, went back several decades ago, computers were not really able to calculate calculate large number sets very quickly but say uh, now you fast forward to 1980 or maybe even 1990 you still had problems loading very large excel files into your into your computer you go to today and really we've it doesn't matter how much faster uh, computers get we've hit the limit on how fast we need excel to work yeah. So I don't have any problems using Excel anymore. So even if computer chips do continue to accelerate, certain activities won't continue to accelerate as well in terms of their usefulness. I always find it very curious, these sort of <laughs> predictions. Yeah, um, not a huge fan. Uh, okay, so then move on to um, maybe thinking about more about the economics then. That was a nice introduction of, of, the, uh, of the actual technology itself. You had a nice way of uh, conceptualizing how these new technologies might affect the economy in terms of unknown unknowns and known unknowns. Maybe you could give us some insight into that. Well, yeah, I think um, the first thing is um, in terms of how new technologies emerge into the economy, it should be said that um, this is not the first time a conversation like this has happened. It's been happening for centuries, really, in terms of every new wave of technology that comes along. Um, but the most thing that I suppose that people talk about is the dichotomy around the impact on labor. And most people come in with, they either have this optimistic view where this new technology is going to be benign, it's going to you know the, uh, bring all these new great benefits, or they have the pessimist outlook at the, before they even understand the technology and they think everything is going to be disastrous. And so so, but, you know, there are a, a lot of commentary out there that is rooted in the person's opinion or, uh, or viewpoint around are they optimistic in general or pessimistic around technology. Whereas actually you really got to delve into each technology individually and really understand it. And so I think when we look at something like um, machine learning, the first thing that's important, and we might come into this in a bit more detail, but it's to understand that really any new technology affects labor primarily at the task base. So a technology does not affect an entire job. Every job is made up, an occupation is made up of lots of different uh, individual tasks. And it's very, very rare that a new technology will come in and, and, and take over all the tasks. It may start to eat away at a few of them. So as we think about some of the, some of the areas that uh, machine learning um, might affect the total economy as we go forward, um, it's important to try to break down what are the effects, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, we don't know or can't measure all of these uh, at the moment, but at least to be able to categorize them. And the first thing we probably know that everybody talks about or everyone understands, it's easy to understand to some degree, is the displacement effect. So, you know, a simple way of looking at it is, you know, that Amazon used to hire people to do uh, two tasks, very simply. It's, it's not as simple as this, but I, I'll reduce it to this, that they hire two tasks within the warehouse. One was to go and retrieve it, uh, the, the, the human worker in there had to go and retrieve a pallet that contained the widget that I was buying as part of my uh, Christmas order. And next thing then, they had to pick it off the pallet and put it into a, a box. And uh, they bought a company called Kiva, based in Massachusetts, which is a robotics company that effectively roboticized one task, which was the retrieval of the pallet. So the robot now in an Amazon warehouse goes out, it retrieves the pallet, it brings it to the human who stands in the same place all day, 
And so the human now only has to do the picking. So it's not as simple as this, but imagine now the work of the human has halved. The job hasn't gone away, but maybe half the work is needed because the robot uh, with machine learning built in and lots of other technologies is doing half it. Well, that's the kind of displacement effect. Um, and so we could, if that was all that was going to happen in the economy, that's quite well known. Well, then we're going to lose a load of jobs and it's going to be bad for us. Yeah. So when I think about it, though, the first round is you lose the job. But then there are other knock-on effects. Like the per- the person is no longer employed here, but they can they're free to go somewhere else. Also, the fact that it loses you lose the job, the cost comes down. Therefore, it might open up other opportunities in the economy. So the net effect, the net general equilibrium effect, is is is, is a bit un- unknown then. Right, and that's exactly I suppose what we're interested in. Some of the people I work with are really trying to look at this in detail for around machine learning. Because okay, if we can leave the displacement effect to one side, we're well obviously we need to continue to measure that and understand it in more detail. But um, like if that Amazon center, let's for the sake of simplicity, um, uh, now saves a bunch of money because it uses robots and not human labor, and um, let's assume that's cheaper. Well, then in, in a competitive market, Amazon would bring down its prices so now me as the purchaser i've got more money to go spend on let's just call it haircuts i got my haircut uh, instead of once a month i now get a cut every three weeks now that is not a job getting your haircut is not a job that is on the trajectory for any anybody or any robot in the near future let's just say, let's just say that's robot proof for for at least our lifetime i think that's even ray kurzweil might agree with that one <laughs> um, um, so now you've got this uh, countervailing effect one of them is around the productivity and that's good because there's more money in the economy and we all go out and get more haircuts. But there are other interesting things that sometimes it's easy to skip over. Like, so for example, machine learning will also make existing automated technologies more effective. And that has no displacement effect on labor. So to talk about that... Uh, the example uh, uh, that I like is um, Amazon, uh, sorry, uh, Google, uh, who are obviously a phenomenal research almost inst- company or institute almost in, in their own right. They bought a company called DeepMind and they applied DeepMind on trying to improve the cooling and they, I, I suppose, uh, uh, the energy efficiency of their data centers. They managed to do this by a phenomenal amount, something like 30 or 40 percent, which in this industry is transformational. And they did it by applying some machine learning um, applications to the existing technology. Now, when an Amazon data center gets 30-40% more efficient, it doesn't put anybody out of work. So what you've got now is, in theory, Amazon could pass on, sorry, Google in this situation, Google could pass on the cost savings to all the consumers, and we can all now get haircuts every two weeks in a very simplistic yeah, terms. Yeah. So that's a way that a new technology like this can actually have a countervailing effect, a positive effect, and it affects no labor. So understanding these things is difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that comes to mind, though, is you say that Google make these investments in in the artificial intelligence that helps whatever reduce the cost of, of of the data center and we have a few big players of google facebook amazon maybe and perhaps a few others and they're maybe the leaders when it comes to a lot of this investment in this area and if their incentive is to reduce the cost of data centers well that's where the cost that's that's where the research and development will be directed whereas instead of for example predicting where there's going to be outbreaks of disease or something like that is not necessarily primary primary objective of Google. So with all this research and development concentrated in this in these few companies, like is this creating some sort of uh, misdirection of, of funds? Well, the, well, um, I certainly can't answer that, you know, just yet. It's probably too early. But I will say there are some characteristics of machine learning that suggest that that should not be too much of a problem, um, for, certainly versus previous technologies. And really, the, the it comes down to the fact that the algorithms are publicly available. So anybody can use them. And in fact, you uh, you really need the algorithms and you need a, a data set and then you need somebody capable of, of doing the training. So whether you want to do disease outbreak analysis or whatever motive with commercial or non-profit or whatever your motive is, um, I think that today the barriers for using this technology have been substantially reduced 
And in going going forward into the future, I think it's just going to proliferate. So they don't hold any kind of patents in terms of the you know the machine learning technology, the base algorithms. Most of them are, are, are freely available or published. And there's rarely just one algorithm that's like some master algorithm. And if they just had that, everything will be magic. Really, a lot of their value comes in the fact that they have better data sets. And the algorithms are really only as good as the data that you feed them. Um, so sure, Google... Amazon, you know, their corporate entities, they will continue to do what's in their own shareholder interest as viewed by their managers. But um, I'm not worried that they're going to lock it down. And one other thing we talked about there as well, I, mean, I talked about the countervailing forces, you have the displacement effect, and then, of course, Amazon can come along and they can drop their prices, and then uh, some of the already automated technology can get more efficient. But there will also be a generation of brand new jobs. And that's something that's it's not really the job of an economist today or really anybody studying the technology today to detail all the future jobs that are going to be created because it's just not possible. I mean, we can all do it, but it's an exercise in futility, really. Yeah. Um, and so we do, you know, I can give an example of something like a, a self-driving car uh, engineer okay that would be a brand new job we get that because self-driving cars haven't existed in the past but there'll be all kinds of new jobs that are going to come out of that and 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 i and really the reason i believe in that so strongly is that uh, not just because it's always happened in the past that's one good indicator but also because it's rooted in human desire for just new and interest in things and as long as that's part of our makeup as a society mm-hmm. I think we'll always be trying to create some new job for some new person yeah I definitely see that sort of passing through if we say for example you think about for example uh, Henry Ford invented a good system of uh, production lines or whatever that made cars cheaper. Then we had increase in prolifer- proliferation of cars. Then we had more jobs for mechanics and people working in petrol stations, things like that. So that increased, that had a, a net positive effect. But if, for example, the price of the car didn't go down, it was more profitable for him to keep the price up and that perhaps wouldn't have these knock-on effects. So I sort of feel like, is there a case that a good market sort of guides uh, guides the sort of knock-on effects. Yeah, um, I suppose I think a market is a very efficient way of bringing a new technology. A certain, uh, certainly, what we you know, general-purpose technology like this, one of the major inventions. Um, just to you know, sidetrack on that a little bit. Um, not all technologies are created equal. So, for example, you know, we all might use the word technology when we talk about a TV going from HD to 4K. Okay, it's been an upgrade in technology. That's not the same as what we call a general purpose technology, something like electricity, the internal combustion engine, semiconductors, or what I believe machine learning, I think will be one of these as well. They have very different properties and they affect the economy very differently. We still use the one word technology, but it, it probably doesn't fully en- encompass it. And when some of these new brand new general purpose technologies come to the market i i you know i wouldn't have much faith in a in a centralized command and control model at a government level to try to diffuse these um i think that the the you know the market economy is the best way that we'll bring these and 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 get all the um countervailing forces to play like i talked about and and actually the funny thing is um for uh, uh, some re- really good studies on this recently um david order talks about uh, general purpose technologies are these really big ones are the ones we fear the most but actually they're the ones that often bring about as you kind of described with the uh, ice the internal combustion engine um, they brought about all these car mechanic jobs they brought about motels they brought about um, uh, you know highway construction all that kind of stuff and so actually we probably shouldn't worry about them near as much as we should worry about what David called like the so-so technologies these are technologies that really don't look that they're back they're that big or they're kind of that big of an impact if you think about something as simple as uh, a telephone answering machine uh, actually maybe what that's going to do is have the displacement effect that we don't quite need as many um, uh, people answering phones in offices anymore so you'll have the displacement effect but then you won't have any of the countervailing uh, effects so actually so-so technologies are probably worse off for us than these big ones that we worry about right okay and That sort of brings me on to maybe perhaps some of the social effects that we see in the last few years a shift from a lot of manual-based work and maybe low-skilled work to more higher-skilled work and a lot of service-based jobs. And if, if, for example, we we take the Amazon example and somebody's 
maybe is out of a job because the machine is, is doing things more efficiently, there might be more jobs available, but they don't have the skill set to, to serve those jobs. So will there will there be some sort of sort of social requirement to try and ensure that there's a just transition? I think that I think this is the critical point. I am not worried that there won't be new jobs created because of machine learning and other technologies. And let's be really clear, machine learning is going to take decades to unravel. In fact, some of the technologies that emerged 10 or 20 years ago are only having their impact today. We point to things like ML, but it's more stuff like the internet and semiconductor. So it's going to take decades to unfold. And I do think that the big concern should not be around, well, will there be a, you know enough jobs for everybody and that kind of stuff. Um, the things I would be worried about much more so are, one, will the people who are displaced be able to transition. Now, I think in Ireland, we're, the phrase is the just transition. And then I'd also worry about uh, not the will there be enough jobs, but will wages be high enough? So I don't think we have a jobs problem. Uh, I know a lot of my stuff is US focused, but uh, even to some degree, most advanced economies, we don't have an employment problem. We have a wages problem uh, amongst the lower uh, income groupings. So uh, when I think about something like uh, the just transition, um, it's an inevitability of of our economy that uh, some industries will die and some industries will grow. We've known about this some, since Schumpeter all those years ago. And so the difficulty for uh, for people, for economies, for individuals, for communities, um, you know, is rooted in, um, in that phrase around, you know, the, the putty clay uh, problem. You know, when we're young or 25 or whatever, we're like putty. We can be molded. We can do all kinds of different jobs. By the time we're 50, we're like, you know, solid clay. We're very difficult to change and you know this is not necessarily a bad actor problem it's not like somebody is is trying to put these communities out of business um and there uh, one difficulty we do have is that the types of policy responses that are available to governments uh, even if they are properly incentivized, and that's a, certainly another big problem, especially in the US, even if a government wants to do something about supporting these communities that get devastated by a, you know, a technology transition, uh, place-based policy interventions are not necessarily always effective. And they're very difficult to manage because so many things are wrapped up in this. It's not just about, well, look, you know, I know in Ireland, I think in the recent budget, they gave X number of millions to somewhere in the Midlands where they're trying to support the just transition. Even if you double the amount or treble the amount, there's no guarantee it'll work. Um, you know, place-based policies are, are very difficult to execute. So, okay, so when you say place-based policy, you mean like a certain town that's getting negatively affected but by, by like for example at, in Lanesborough where they're, cut, where they're shutting down the, the peat station and then there's there's some sort of just transition proposed so well what would be the alternative then to a place-based policy well, it's, so it's not that I'm saying that um, there there's be. an alternative I'm just saying that they're very difficult oh sure fair enough yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. and I think that we should be aware of that yeah. because um, I think that we you know the important thing is that we recognize it and of course I'm talking about in even an ideal situation where like in Ireland it is fantastic that at least we we are putting forward the idea of just transition I think that the vast majority of people including the government in Ireland even yeah. if it was that the opposition was in government I think most people would probably be on board with that not every country agrees to those kinds of things yeah. Um, and so it's great that in Ireland uh, there is a focus on that, but we shouldn't uh, think that that's enough. Yeah, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff outside of just the 3 million or 10 million or 30 million that you might give to a community. So people's individual identity is wrapped up in, in, in their work. Um, and people... Uh, society's view on what it means to be unemployed or out of work or be trying to start new work that's not stuff you can uh, solve with just another 10 million euros sure no it has to be directed i suppose effectively in terms of, and in a way that creates employment in a sustainable manner and not necessarily just subsidizing something because that can be that spiral of a different kind well, that, that actually is, you know, it's linked in. I don't say the exact same, but certainly linked in with uh, some of the discussions around universal basic income um, and, you know, whether with all the abundance that something like these digital technologies, machine learning being part of it, all that abundance that it's creating, it's going to make us so much more productive. Its economy is going to make the society or the economy in total much wealthier. And we're going to have enough money that we can actually give a check of, let's say, 10,000 uh, euros or dollars a year to every 
everybody in society. And uh, the idea of that is that, well, if people don't necessarily want to work, they want to spend their time doing other things, good for them. And so... Uh, I think it's kind of linked in with that as well because uh, I think it's the Voltaire quote around that uh, you know work spares us from three evils uh, boredom vice and need so the need if you give money to people that solves one of the problems but there's an awful lot more going on with work and so whether you've been recently displaced or you're in an area that doesn't have much labour opportunity outside of say like the what some people call the superstar cities etc um, the, the uh, complications around and uh, universal basic income, I think, are uh, certainly not solved. Yeah, so, like, the universal basic income, yeah, I find it very interesting. And I can see if we have, if, if we go back to the Amazon example, and Amazon uh, create a new technology, that means that we have less labor. They still are earning the same amount of money, but their, their, their costs are going down. They're getting, their profits would then go up. And that's shifting the economic rents from labor to more to capital. And in that context, it seems that, okay, well, if, if, if that continues, well, then maybe we need universal basic income to correct for that. Another way to correct for that, I would see, is if the market was competitive, well, then prices would come down and then Amazon wouldn't be taking as much cream from the top and the money would be in the economy anyway. So is universal basic income, is it like a correction for a poor market or where, where would that fit in in, in that context, I wonder? Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of we have to be very careful about what tool we're using to solve what problem. Yeah. And a lot of the discussion, um, you know, um, in politics, in the community at the moment, it's great that we're talking about these things, but oftentimes we're mixing up many different problems and thinking that there's one silver bullet that will solve them all. Um, and so I rarely, you know, there's not many problems. I think that universal basic income is the solution for. Um, I'm much more in favor of things like um, the earned income credits, uh, which is kind of like a negative tax. So, for example, in the United States, we have a version of this, which is um, quite basic, really. If you earn um, probably about, I think it's about fifteen or 20000 as I say, a, a two-child family, you'll get something like $5,000 a year back as a tax rebate um, once you fill out your, your annual tax uh, returns. And so... It encourages work, which is very important in the United States now, uh, you know, especially with the, the voting works over there. Um, people are very against any idea that might even hint at a handout. Mm -hmm. So I think something like an earned income credit is very useful because when they're talking about universal basic income, like giving a 10000 dollar a year check to everybody in the economy first of all in the united states let's just be realistic what they're talking about doing is is then cutting things like medicare and medicaid and housing support systems so you you're going to take away all those things which are very well directed right now right. and so if you look at something like the earned interest uh, um, uh, earned income credit um that is about uh, the vast majority of it vast majority of it goes to the bottom 30 percent of uh, fa uh, of income earning families mm -hmm. so if you take that away and start uh, taking away the directed supports and just giving uh, um, a general universal basic income i don't think that's the right direction okay so i suppose moving on another topic that that comes into mind um i don't know if you've done any work on this area but when we think about um machine learning we think about a lot of these sort of technologies they can have a lot of productive uses in terms of traditional maybe manufacturing and industry and, and the, the examples we gave, like the Amazon example, they can also be used for other purposes, like we think about all the data that, 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 that these companies would have on our activity, our preferences and our behavior. And it seems like there's a lot of information, there's a lot of the raw materials there. And then the likes of Facebook and, and Google, they're, they're developing the technologies to make the best use of that information. And that can be used to distort are well not to sort of guide us towards behaviors that perhaps may not be in our best interest for example taking on a lot of debt maybe gambling consuming the wrong financial products as well as like major life altering decisions as well as perhaps buying the wrong book or whatever so like is is this something that we should be concerned about do we need some sort of regulation around this like is, would, would you see any any issue here um, I think it's very valid that we're looking at this and, and I do think that it will be increasing focus on it as we as we go into the future. But I also think that uh, we 
should be careful about using broad stroke solutions to this. So if you think about something like AI, let's call it AI regulation. For me, something like a generic AI regulation doesn't really make much sense because in different industries and in different verticals, it can have very different impacts. Um, and so if you look at something like if we had a general catch-all AI regulation and, you know, building on the points you use there, it would cover something for something like Netflix, which is recommending the next movie I should watch. That's using some machine learning. But it'll also uh, try to capture or regulate in some way how Google is building a self-driving car or Tesla is doing that. And so they're very different, different uh, industries with very different um, impacts on, uh, on the end user. So I think that when we think about AI regulation, we should be doing it industry by industry. And that will mean very different things. So, for example, you use the uh, you, you talked about they're taking on maybe too much debt or too much loans, maybe gambling too much. I absolutely think that whatever the technology is, whether it's machine learning um, or something else that we, we don't even know what's coming out just yet is being used um, for that purpose. I think regulation, so certainly at a social level, should be should be part of the toolbox for for policymakers. But I don't think it, we should be worrying about it across a whole economy and trying to say we need to regulate all of this across everything. Um, again, this comes down to it being a general purpose technology. So if you think about something, I used the version earlier on that like electricity or, um, or the internal combustion engine or general purpose technologies. When electricity was coming out, there was no point in us talking about every, every potential use, every item, everything that could ever be created coming out of electricity could have one big uh, you know, regulator. Actually, what you need to do is make sure that you regulate the safe transmission of energy, and as, as you know much more about me, uh, than the pricing of it, of course, yeah. that's important. But the, 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 the secondary and tertiary effects of it I think need to be managed on a case by case basis. Yeah, that's interesting. The sort of the nuance. I never thought of it like that. And it, like it makes a lot of sense. You think about things like like gunpowder. Gunpowder in a gun needs to be regulated. Gunpowder, I think there's gunpowder even in Christmas crackers and things like that, you know, it's relatively harmless. Right. You know, you know, any instrument used for the wrong intention can do harm. So there are lots of technologies. You know, people worry about self-driving cars, for example. They're going to start killing people, or that. Uh, well, if you know, if I've got a self-driving car, uh, if my car is self-driving, yours isn't. You'll start behaving differently towards me and creating crashes because you know the self-driving car won't respond to you and all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, you can overthink some of these things. The reason that there is not more car crashes today out there the reason there's not tens or hundreds of thousands a year in ireland is because most people don't want to get into car crashes that's not going to change when self-driving cars come out um so we need to be cognizant of the particular sector and 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 um the importance of the technology within that yeah no it reminds me of behavioral economics and when we had liam delaney on he mentioned that they had this whole ethics of using behavioral insight because it's, it's another toolkit that you can use to try and predict what people are going to do and it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And I think it, it, this fits into a similar similar cachet in that sense. Okay, so Jonathan, just to, to wrap up then, one topic that might be of interest is uh, firms readjusting to accommodate AI and an argument that, that we prob- perhaps don't have enough AI. Um, where would you stand on that? I think we're really at the very earliest stages of the diffusion of machine learning into our economy. And the technology as we know it now is established enough that it's ready for a lot more firms to start reorganizing around it. And this is probably the stuff that won't make the you know, New York Times headlines, but is actually where the real meat of extracting the value from this new technology will come. So firms need to look at this new technology. They need to look at their entire existing business process, what it is that they're trying to deliver, and whether they're trying to reduce cost, improve efficiency, improve quality, whatever it is that they're trying to do, how can you completely reorganize? Is that relevant? Is that valid to completely reorganize your firm around this? And I think that's going to, you know, like every other major technology, that's going to take decades to unfold. But that that's why I'm confident that for years and years to come, machine learning will be still adding to productivity in the economy. Right. Okay. That's, that's a positive note to add on. And right. John. Okay, Jonathan, well, thank you very much for joining me today. And uh, it's great to have you on great, board. Great to be here. Thank you very much. 
So thank you to John for his time. Lest there be any doubt, we do not place any blame on the whole of big data for not predicting the spread of COVID-19. So it's funny how the world has changed a lot since that conversation took place. Um, but I suppose given the huge effort that's underway at the moment and a lot of the work that's been done by holders of big data, I suppose my scepticism was somewhat misplaced. If you enjoyed this or other episodes, please give us a rating on Apple Podcasts. You can scroll down right now while you're listening to me ramble on and hit the five star button if you have an iPhone. Reviews are really heavily weighted on the Apple chart algorithm, something I've come to realize lately. We always seem to climb the charts when we get a few reviews. So thanks to all who have given us the five stars to date. And if you get the chance, it would really mean a lot. So I have some exciting new episodes lined up over the next few weeks with some great guests. So tell your friends and I look forward to speaking to you next week.